Well, if you're anything like me, you like to learn how to do things. Doesn't necessarily mean you like doing everything, but you like to learn how things are done. I used to love that show, How Things Are Made. Uh, I always found that very intriguing. There's just something about acquiring a new skill uh, that engenders a sense of pride, a sense of accomplishment when you learn to do and you do something for yourself. I think there's an internal satisfaction uh, that we experience no matter where you are, no matter uh, where you are in life. Every parent remembers uh, the joy uh, on their face, the, the joy on their kid's face when your kid learned to tie their shoes for the first time. You guys remember that? You just, there's just a joy in learning how to do something new. And every grandparent remembers the smile on their kid's face when their children learned how to use the toilet. There's just something exciting about learning how to do something new. The joy, the satisfaction we learn when we do something new. Teenagers, we experience this uh, when you get your first cell phone or the freedom you get when you learn how to drive a car. Adults, we get energized when we learn how to do something new too. We, we get energized when we learn how to cook a new recipe, when we figure out how to f- fix that thing that's been broken at the house for so long. And we especially get excited when we learn how to use our cell phone before our teenagers have to show us how. We love learning how to do new things. And I'd say we love this so much that I, when I look around at our, at our culture, when I look at, around at our media, I, say, I would say that we live in a how-to Culture. Now think about it, when you visit websites, the, one of the most popular types of articles on, on websites is a, 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 an ongoing theme of how to do different things, right? Seven steps, or seven different ways you can style your hair. Uh, five different ways that you can uh, have a happier life. Three reasons you should uh, apply for a new job today. We were having some mic feedback in the earlier service, and I'm sure our sound people were, were Googling how to stop mic feedback. We are in a how to culture. We're obsessed with learning how to do new things. If you go online, you can go to video streaming sites, and there are uh, uh, episodes after episodes of people and telling you how to do anything, from whether it's to uh, build a tree house or how to open a Pop-Tart. I mean, there are just how-to videos all over the place. There's even a television station, DIY, do it yourself. We love to learn how to do new things. Many of the best-selling books um, uh, over the last couple of years are how-to books, and they, they just satiate our how-to culture. Uh, there's one popular book, I don't remember what it's called, but it's How to Tidy Up Your House. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. It's basically a book on how to fold your clothes. It's one of the most popular, Noah's reading it right now. I, I don't know what that says about Noah, but it's one of the most popular books of the last couple of years, How to Tidy Up Your House. Seriously, there's one of the, uh, one of the other books you might have uh, heard of it, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And this is an adult book. It's not a children's book about how to make friends, how to win friends and influence people. When I was in seminary, one of the courses, I didn't take it, so I didn't read the book, but one of the courses on its syllabi had a, a, a book that the students were required to read, and it was titled, How to Read a Book. And it's, it's been selling for years. I mean, this is like a 50-year-old book. We love to learn how to. And is it any wonder in, in light of our culture that when we go to the Bible, we get drawn to the how-to passages. We love to learn how to understand, how to interpret, how to apply, how to live out the scriptures. And sometimes we look for how-tos when a how-to isn't there. That's a sermon for a different day. But in scripture, in scripture today, we're gonna read several instructions that Paul gives us and he gives to a, a church in Greece. And, and one of our frustrations is that when it gets to these, uh, these instructions, Paul takes a long time to tell us how to, how to do all these good things that God teaches uh, so if you have your Bibles today, turn to uh, Philippians chapter 4. This is a passage you've heard, uh, you've probably heard quoted many times. It's a pretty straightforward teaching. It's, it's very clear. It's very specific. It's easy to understand, but it is hard to practice. We're going to be starting in verse, uh, verse, chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, in many ways, at first look, this is a very encouraging passage, right? It it lifts up positive Christian virtues. It's clear. It's specific. But when we reflect upon this in our own lives, if you're like me, you're thinking, well, I don't do those things very consistently. 
I mean, I don't rejoice in every situation, right? I'm certainly not gentle all the time. My prayer life, it's, it's okay sometimes, but I certainly don't pray in every situation. And when you come across verses like this, I don't know if you're like me, you, you just wonder, how are we possibly supposed to rejoice this? I mean, rejoice sometimes, yeah, I can do that. But all times, can we really rejoice always? I mean, there's definitely situations in each of our lives that make rejoicing, that make joy very difficult. We work with people. We go to school with people who make joy difficult. Some of you are sitting next to somebody that makes joy difficult. If I was a Baptist preacher, I would tell you to look at your neighbor and say, you make joy difficult. But I'm a Methodist preacher, so I'm just gonna have you think about it. We judge silently in in our church. That's the godly way, right? Off script, don't put that on the website. Some of us, all right. There's plenty of reasons in life not to rejoice. We could, we could go through that list really easy. So how can God expect us to rejoice always? Now, oftentimes when we come to a, a verse that's difficult to apply, that's difficult to practice, there's a, there's a tendency, there's an urge within us to say, okay, well, maybe this actually means something different. So before we go trying to, to change the meaning of the text, there's an imp- important biblical interpretation principle I wanna teach to you guys. Uh, and I call it putting yourself in their shoes. And this is a, another way of saying, the Bible can't mean to us something it did not mean to them. It can't mean to us something it did not mean to them. Now the them in this situation is the original hearers, the original readers of the scripture. So what I like to do is I like to put myself in their shoes, or I guess in the first century it'd be put yourself in their sandals. Uh, Put yourself in their shoes. See, every book of the Bible, uh, we we believe that the the scriptures were inspired by God and all the scriptures were written to uh, specific people in specific times and and for specific places. So when we come to difficult verses to understand, it's important to understand what it meant, what the context of of the original hearers was so that we can understand what it means for us as well. So let's, uh, we're gonna put this principle to practice and we're gonna put ourselves in their shoes so we can understand what the Philippians would have understood as they were listening to Paul's teaching. So Paul was an apostle. He uh, planted a lot of churches in the, in the Mediterranean area. And uh, he, wrote, um, uh, he wrote to a group of Christians in the city of Philippi, which is in Greece. And this letter, the, the book of Philippians, it's kind of an encouragement letter. And it's also a thank you letter because this church had supported Paul financially in his missionary endeavors. So 10 years before he wrote this letter, he planted the church in Philippians. And the backstory to, to, the, to the plant is pretty fascinating. It, it probably should be made into a movie. Um, so Paul goes to, to Greece, this area called Macedonia. Uh, Paul and his traveling companion Silas, they go out to the city of Philippi. And one Sabbath, uh, they go out to this well, they meet some women, they end up leading one of them uh, to the Lord named Lydia. And uh, so then they start sharing the gospel throughout the city. And as Paul and Silas are going through the city and sharing the gospel, there's this, there's this girl that starts following them around. And this girl has an affliction. She's possessed by a demon. Now, I know that's kind of strange for us today. Uh, and it was probably strange for them back in that time too. But this, this demon possession gave her a, a unique ability. She was able to see the future. She could tell people's fortunes. Now, Acts 16 also tells us that this young woman, uh, she was a slave. She had owners and her owners were profiting from her abilities. So while Paul and Silas are going around the city sharing the gospel, this this girl starts following him and she's starting to draw attention and Paul gets tired of it. So he turns around, he says, in the name of Jesus, come out. And instantly the girl is healed. The demon leaves her, she is no longer possessed. And we think that's exciting, right? That's, that's, That's a yay God. We would write that on the back of the green cards on the back of our chairs. But the girl's owners weren't so happy about it. See, they were making a lot of money from what she could do. And so the, the girl's owners, they get so mad at Paul and Silas that they drag him then to the center of the city, put him in front of, of the whole city, all the rulers of Philippi, and they start to beat them and torture them. Now, if you saw the, the Easter movie, The Passion of the Christ, you know exactly what those whips looked like. You know exactly the kind of pain and torment these two men would have experienced. Oftentimes, people didn't even survive it. So after being publicly mocked and publicly beaten, Paul and Silas were dragged to prison. And something amazing happens when they're in prison. We read it in Acts chapter 16, verse 25. Paul and Silas, in their prison cell, they start to praise and worship God. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. 
Can you imagine what the jailer and the other prisoners would have been thinking as they saw, I mean, they, they would have seen the scars. They would have seen the ripped flesh out of these two men. And at midnight, they're praising and worshiping. They had to have just been blown away. I mean, these guys were just beaten. And they're thinking, why would you be praising God after what just happened to you? Many of us would be mad at God in that situation. We get mad at God over much smaller situations. And at midnight, as they start praising, as they start singing praises to God, another miracle happens. An earthquake hits the jail cell. It tears down the wall. It breaks off the chains of, their, uh, of the prisoner's chains and everyone on, in the prison is free. And the first service, I told a joke, so I'm, I'm just gonna tell you it's a joke so that you laugh because they didn't laugh in the first service. This is the passage I think Tori should preach the next time she preaches because it literally teaches that praising and worshiping can set you free. So I think that's funny. Man, you guys didn't, I even told you to laugh and you didn't laugh. I don't, need it. I don't know what I'm gonna do with you guys. Turn to your neighbor and say, you should have laughed. <laughs> the Baptist pastor coming out with me. So the prison cells are open. The doors are fogging. The, the chains are gone. And Paul does something even more unthinkable. Instead of everybody running out, the, the Philippian jailer, he starts to wake up. And when he sees what happens, he draws out his sword. But he doesn't try to kill the prisoners. He doesn't try to keep them in. Instead, he turns it on himself. See, the Philippian jailer, uh, if he was the one in charge and the Roman rulers, they would have held him accountable if any of the prisoners escaped. So when he sees that the doors are gone, he knows that if they get out, that he's gonna be put on trial, he's gonna be beaten, tortured, he might even be killed. So he starts to take his own life. And Paul says, hey man, you don't have to do that. We're here, we're not gonna go anywhere. Paul and Silas, they choose to stay in, in jail so that the jailer doesn't get in trouble. The Philippian jailer, he runs up to Paul and he's like, man, I gotta get what you got. I don't, know, I don't know what is keeping you in here, but would you tell me what do I need to do to be saved? Paul tells him, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And at this moment, this is how the Philippian church starts. Not a bad backstory, huh? I mean, we just celebrated 20 years. Ours was pretty cool, but they started with a miracle, a persecution, jail and another miracle. So 10 years later, Paul writes, another, uh, writes a letter to this church and he thanks them. And where's Paul writing this letter from? He's in jail again. Paul's in jail in Rome. And the Philippians, as they're reading the letter, as they realize that Paul's writing from jail, they're probably thinking, well, of course he is. That's what Paul does. Everywhere he goes, he preaches the gospel. He's always in jail. Everywhere he goes, Paul's writing this letter from prison. And that's what makes this letter so perplexing. That was what makes the teaching that we just read so hard to understand because even though Paul is constantly facing hardships because of he's sharing the gospel, he tells his friends in Philippi to rejoice always. And we wanna say, all right, Paul, we know, that, we know that you're really close to God. We know that you rejoice, but how could you possibly do this? I mean, you were beaten, you were put in prison time and time again. We know you do it, did it, but how can we possibly follow this teaching? And before Paul tells us, as if rejoicing all the time wasn't difficult enough, in verse six, Paul tells us not to be anxious and not to worry. In verse six, he says, do not be anxious about anything. Gee, thanks, Paul. I mean, any more easy instructions you wanna give us? Any more easy instructions you wanna tell us to be kind to our in-laws and not to have road rage? I mean, don't worry, don't be anxious about anything. Don't you hate it when someone gives you that advice? Hey, don't worry about it as if worry and anxiety has an on-off switch that you can just turn on and off. I'm not gonna sit on this too long, but I don't wanna pass it over as if this is something that's just easy to do. Overcoming anxiety, dealing with stress and worry is not something that you and I can just will ourselves out of. But there is something tangible we can do. It's simple and it's practical. practical. God tells us that in every situation, that we can pray, that we can talk to God. In every situation, present your request to God. Now, before you write this off, it's just another pastor telling you to pray and everything's gonna be okay. That's not what I'm saying. And that's not what scripture is teaching. This is not a, a, a name it and claim it prosperity gospel. Prayer won't make everything better in your life. But there is something that prayer absolutely will do. 
In verse seven, we learn that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And when we read the peace of God, I say, sign me up for that. I mean, isn't that what the Philippian jailer wanted? He didn't understand how could Paul and Silas, how could they be beaten and still sing and still worship and have the peace of God? How could they stay in jail? I mean, if I had been beaten, I would be bitter. I'd be angry. I'd be mincered. I'd be running out of the jail cell and say, I'm gonna go plant a church in another city. Forget these guys. But Paul and Silas, beyond understanding, experienced the peace of Christ. And that peace led someone to salvation. I think the reason that Paul and Silas had such peace in the midst of their hardship, it's something that's true for us today as well. They knew that my circumstances can't destroy me when my savior defines me. My circumstances can't destroy me when my savior defines me. Yeah, their circumstances, they stunk, but God's peace was in their hearts. And we wanna know what that peace looks like, right? I can tell you exactly what it doesn't look like. It doesn't mean that all your problems are suddenly gonna go away. It doesn't mean that the circumstances in life that are there causing you anxiety or worry are not gonna go away. We know that because Paul was in jail while he was writing this letter, right? The peace of God does not mean that everything in your life that is leading to your worry and your anxiety and your disappointments will suddenly be resolved. It certainly didn't get any easier for Paul. But something that Paul repeats in this passage that's so important for us to understand if you, uh, if you like to underline in your Bible, if that's how you like to learn, underline the word in, in verse six and seven. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. And the peace of God will guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. See, we're taught to pray in every situation, in the midst of every situation. We're not taught to rejoice for or because of every situation. I think there's a huge difference in that. This November will mark the 10th year of my uh, cancer diagnosis. I've been in remission for a long time, but I can honestly tell you that not once have I rejoiced because I had cancer. I didn't thank God that I went through that. I'm still not happy that I went through it. We don't rejoice because of the hardships in our life. We rejoice in them because God is with us. And Paul and Silas, they rejoiced in the midst of their suffering because they knew that their circumstances could not destroy them when their savior defined them. Who you are, your value is not determined by what happens to you. It's determined by Jesus. And that's why in every situation, you and I, we can pray. And our prayers are gonna look different based on what you're going through. I love the sequence in verse six. It says, by prayers, by petition, by thanksgiving. We don't just pray prayers of thanksgiving. We pray prayers of petition, the kind of prayers where we're asking God for help. And sometimes when we're going through something difficult, those prayers are gonna look like venting. They're gonna look like complaining. They're gonna, look, they're gonna be angry prayers. Friends, God wants us to be honest in our prayers, honest to God in our prayers, you don't have to sugarcoat what you're going through. We can be honest in every situation because God can handle it. God is so confident in his identity that he inspired prayers and scriptures that question his job performance. Think about that for a second. God is so confident in who he is. We believe that, that God, we're told in scripture that God inspired all scripture. And when you read, especially in the Psalms, so many of them question God's goodness. They question his love. They question whether he's in their life or not. And God inspired those words to be written. In Psalm 22, King David is in agony and he prays to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I cry out by day, but you do not answer. Now, the truth is, David wasn't forsaken, but that's how he felt. And so God looks at David, whom he loves, and he says, you know what, David? I want you to pray exactly what you're feeling. I want you to write this down. I want you to question my goodness. 
I want you to question my presence in your life. I want you to question my job performance and I'm gonna preserve those prayers. I'm gonna preserve those words for generation so that everyone can know they can be honest to God in their prayers. You know what that tells us about the character of God? He can handle any prayer that we give him. Whether we're venting, whether we're frustrated, whether we're questioning, whether we're ticked off prayers, in every situation, by prayers and petition, present your request to God. It's the same prayer that Jesus prayed on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But if you turn the page over in Psalms, and you read Psalm chapter 23, what are the first words? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In every situation, we still thank God. Because something remarkable happens when we pray. When we're honest to God in our prayers, the peace of God guards our hearts. Paul says it in another way, starting in verse eight. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, and whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. And finally, at the end of his letter, Paul tells us the how to, how he is able to rejoice, how we are able to pray in every situation. He starts out by thanking the Philippians for continuing to support them. He said, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned. In verse 11, he says, I'm not saying this because I am in need for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. That's probably a sermon in itself, contentment. Now, if we were writing this verse, we might say, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances, as long as I'm taking in more than I'm spending, as long as my mortgage is paid off, as long as, but Paul says, I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in wants. Again, we see the distinction between being content with something and being content in something. Paul didn't teach to be content with the hardships in our life. He said, find contentment in them. And finally, after all these virtues, after all these instructions, Paul tells us in the Philippians exactly how we can follow this biblical teaching. Verse 13, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I can do all of this. Now, this is a favorite verse for so many people. Uh, You've probably seen it bumper stickers. You've seen the athletes love to quote it. It's encouraging, it's motivational, and unfortunately, it's often misunderstood. See, I can do really has more to do with endurance than it does ability. It doesn't really have anything to do with hitting a jump shot or throwing a touchdown. It doesn't have anything to do with achieving a work promotion or getting more money. What this verse tells us is that we can endure all things. And we know that because we put ourselves in their shoes, right? Paul is talking in this context about being content in every circumstance, about rejoicing in every situation, about praying no, about praying no matter what you're going through. And we know that this scripture isn't talking about our ability to achieve anything because think about it this way. Paul was writing this letter from prison. Paul couldn't do everything he wanted. He didn't have the ability to do anything that he wanted to do. He couldn't release himself from prison. He couldn't take the the shackles off of his wrist. He couldn't even remove the thorn, the challenge in his life that he told the church in Corinthians. Paul couldn't prevent himself from being arrested and put into prison for sharing the gospel. And eventually in the Roman prison, he couldn't prevent them from declaring him guilty. But there was something Paul could do. In every situation, in every hardship in his life, he could endure because of Jesus. And that same truth that the text teaches for us is true for Paul and it's true for us today is that your endurance comes from his from Jesus who gives us strength. Our endurance comes from his. Our ability to endure all the hardships that life throws our way isn't because of something that's naturally within us. Because to be honest with you, I don't have it within me. 
It is not innate. It is not natural within me to rejoice in every situation. It's not natural for me to pray in every situation. I certainly don't dwell on the things of God all the time. I don't have the ability to be content in all things, but Jesus does. And he demonstrated it time and time again in his life, no matter the hardships that he experienced. We learn from the gospels that Jesus was content. He didn't have any possessions. It says he doesn't, didn't even have a place to lay his head. We see that Jesus rejoicing continually, even when he was arrested, beaten, and crucified. And in his last breaths, as he hung on the cross, Jesus prayed, even in that situation, for his enemies. And he said, God, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Throughout his life, Jesus embodied this teaching. So yes, you and I, we can rejoice. We can find God's peace. We can learn God's contentment in any situation, not because of who we are, not because of our innate abilities. Our endurance comes from his. And so at this point, we wanna say how to. What are you going through in life right now? Because all of us have a challenge, right? All of us have that something that is causing frustration, anxiety, worry, fear. We all have that something. And if you're like me, one of the first things you do is you go, to, you go to Google and you say, how to blank. How to deal with a difficult family member. How to overcome anxiety. How to, we wanna learn how to. And friends, I'm not gonna give you a magic formula. I'm not gonna tell you this is exactly what you need to do to overcome everything that you're going through in life. But there is something specific and simple that scripture does teach us this morning. Regardless of what you're going through, pray. And God's Holy Spirit will surround you with a peace that surpasses understanding. Your endurance comes from his. 